I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2020. In a country where we can agree on who won the last presidential election, if viruses are real, or who wore it best, there's one thing that's persisted in uniting the masses. Churros. Churros are categorically the most beloved street food suite of all time. What else could make waiting in line for three hours to vertically plummet from a steel shuttle roller coaster from 413 feet in the air less monotonous or anxiety ridden? Fight me on this, I will come for you. I won't come for you. Also, Americans pretty much all agree that legalizing weed is a good idea. When states like Colorado and California are pulling in over a billion dollars in tax revenue every year, other states and even other countries need to follow their lead and legalize. Legalizing marijuana would not only support in managing current societal stressors, but in neutralizing them. The only reason it's not legal is because the pharmaceuticals wanted to make it illegal so they could benefit. But this consensus is a major reversal from 50 years ago when 84% of Americans thought marijuana should be criminalized. Hey, young America. We need to talk about something called grass. Not that grass. I'm talking about marijuana. And since we know a majority of us support legalization, perhaps it's high time for closeted marijuana users to step out of the shadows of society's stigmatization and shame. I smoke during fights. I always have to smoke. I'm sorry, I'm a smoker. I smoke every day. I never stop smoking. So do you roll these? Mm-hmm. My mission was to get everybody hooked on chronic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's not so much a shadow around marijuana usage as there is a giant high voltage spotlight. A drug once emblematic of counterculture and the anti-war movement is now supported by this guy and a lot of other guys who look like him. It's time for the federal government to take another look at this. And, uh, and I think descheduling this drug, allowing for the research, uh, would be very helpful to the American people. Now, I believe is if his interest in legalizing marijuana had started earlier, he might have enjoyed an even more relaxing speakership. John Boehner, former Republican Speaker of the House, was once a staunch opponent of the drug, but now he's chairman of the lobbying group National Cannabis Roundtable. Despite our not-so-distant legacy of anti-marijuana reefer madness propaganda, today, around two-thirds of Americans favor legalization and support for it defies political party lines. A constitutional amendment legalizing marijuana. 59% reporting you see passing by 67% of the vote. Adults can now smoke, if you want, in New Jersey, Arizona, Montana, and South Dakota. While marijuana is still illegal on the federal level, the law could change soon when the House votes on the Moore Act, which would federally decriminalize cannabis as well as expunge convictions for nonviolent cannabis offenses. Which begs the question, what exactly is a violent cannabis offense? Divorce, violence, murder, suicide and the ultimate end of the marijuana addict. Hopeless insanity. Most owners just want to get baked on the couch, listen to Zeppelin, Postmates something with melted cheese on it, and watch the BBC's Planet Earth for an afternoon. I've been smoking since I was born, man. I could smoke anything, man. Talk it out, man. <laughs> Admittedly, murderous rampage is generally not top of mind. Point is, Many Americans with these kinds of criminal records have been prevented from things as basic as getting a job or applying for a loan. It can even affect things like child custody determinations or immigration status. And the people disproportionately targeted and convicted for these non-violent cannabis offenses? Here's a hint. It's not people who look like this guy. Eight out of 10 people in Buffalo arrested for low-level marijuana possession are African-American. What is it like for you when you sit there and you see somebody called in because they had a small amount of marijuana, a little weed on them, and they're going to jail? It's hurtful. It's hurtful. Because in many cases, those consequences of the arrest, if the case is not dismissed, results in job loss, loss of student loans, and the list goes on. In a study of more than 6 million arrests between 2010 and 2018, 
Black people are still more likely than white people to be arrested for marijuana possession in every state, even though consumption rates are virtually identical. Decriminalizing marijuana isn't just critical for criminal justice reform, but an issue of racial justice. And we've known this for a long time. This is a trillion dollar business. Less than 1% of the licenses right now go to African Americans and Latinos. This is about legalizing it, but it's more than about that. It's about restorative justice. What we haven't been able to track is the impact marijuana arrests have had on Latinx communities specifically, because the federal government doesn't keep data on ethnicity. And it's impossible to accurately assess the impact marijuana arrests have on Latinx communities or the racial targeting likely at play on a national scale without these numbers. In New York, for example, one of only two states where cannabis-related arrest data is available, Latinxes are nearly four times as likely than white people to be arrested. And in California, they accounted for almost half of all cannabis-related arrests. And this is in my home state where weed is fully legal, where we eat cannabis for breakfast, literally. The question is no longer whether or not we should legalize it, but how do we plan to address racial disparities and achieve racial equity through reform? Places like Oakland, California and the state of Illinois are trying to help aspiring pot entrepreneurs with past marijuana convictions by facilitating either licensing or setting aside capital for them to start their own business. A form of reparations intended to help communities harmed by the war on drugs economically. In our case, we had 71% of our cannabis related arrests were in the black community and we are less than 17% of the population um, so we have moved forward with restricting the first $10 million of sales tax from cannabis to fund reparation. Legalization not only presents unique challenges here in the U.S., but abroad. For the last four years, Uruguayans have enjoyed the inalienable right to spark up. The small South American country shocked the world when it became the first to legalize recreational marijuana. I decided to buy marijuana in the pharmacy de acuerdo al consumo que llevo en, 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 en mi hogar, que es más que nada de uso recreativo y sobre todo los fines de semana. Allowing its citizens and residents above the age of 18 to purchase it at pharmacies and to grow up to six plants at home. But don't go booking your flights just yet. The law does not include tourists. Canada caught up with legal recreational use in 2018. And now that Mexico has support from its Supreme Court and Senate, it looks like they are next in line. After legalizing it, Uruguay prepared for three years before allowing its recreational sale. But despite the legalization, the cannabis industry there still faces challenges. Only 17 out of 1,000 government pharmacies sell it. Reason being, most Uruguayan banks refuse to give loans to marijuana-related businesses for fear that U.S. financial institutions will later refuse to do business with them resulting in an underwhelming and mostly cash-only industry for the cannabis pioneer. And U.S. banks aren't just hesitant to do business with international cannabis providers. Here in the U.S., they're so afraid of violating federal law that they've refused to issue loans to national cannabis companies, with some going as far as to deny basic banking services, which means marijuana-related businesses, or MRBs, have a hard time finding places to deposit money, forcing many to run as a mostly cash business, making them targets for robbery and susceptible to exploitation for money laundering. Basically, everything local governments were working to avoid. This friction between the state and the feds has essentially cleared a path for big business to dominate the industry. And back in 2013, the Obama administration, aka the cool parent, basically told federal prosecutors to look the other way when banks did business with MRBs. But in 2018, the Trump administration said, I don't care what your dad said, you're still grounded, and reversed it. I hate when mom and dad fight. Needless to say, the road for these entrepreneurs hasn't been easy, especially if you're the youngest impresario in your state and a woman in a male-dominated industry. My name's Priscilla Vilchez, and if you don't know, there's a movie called Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and my business is in Nevada. They've branded me the female face of cannabis. I saw firsthand that there was an opioid epidemic and wanted to make a difference. I was about 27 years old when I phoned my lawyer and I said, find me the best state 
to where I could invest in marijuana. So I lived in California at the time full time and California was not a good state to invest in. So I packed my stuff and I moved to Nevada to start the empire that I have now. Only one woman made the cut. The leading ladies in the cannabis industry, Ms. Priscilla Vilches. She's the CEO of Cali Premium Produce. I competed against multi-millionaires and billionaires, and I was the only young Latina in a cute dress um, awaiting my, you know, winning licenses. When I first invested in the marijuana industry, everyone thought I was crazy, and now I'm considered a genius. I work with prominent physicians, I work with hospitals, and marijuana was federally legal. So they said, how can you throw away a career that you're doing so well in, managing physicians, to something that is federally illegal? But then again, that's what's the definition of an entrepreneur? A risk taker. I'd love to see the people's reaction when I, you know, go to a board meeting and I'm, you know, the youngest Latina. I hear that your family is Mexican, Mexican-American? They are very Mexican, yes. Very traditionally Mexican. I was never allowed to touch marijuana. They said I would die, you know, if I even made contact with it. Fast forward, here we are, my mother and father doing cash payment pickups and trimming marijuana. The stigma against marijuana still lingers, but in a country where opioids have killed about half a million people in less than two decades, many of which were introduced to them through prescriptions, the idea of denying medical marijuana treatment to someone with chronic pain is not only wrong, but unpatriotic. In 2010, you negotiated the first ever VA medical cannabis policy and you've also overseen the nationwide effort to adopt PTSD as a qualifying condition for state medical cannabis access. There were certain things that seemed kind of lacking in the state programs, qualifying conditions. And we actually looked at a whole bunch of different qualifying conditions. Uh, I actually suffer from pain, long-term chronic pain. I use cannabis for that uh, and it helps a lot and I, it reduces the amount of pain pills that I need to take. That's a very common thing. But actually we chose to work on post-traumatic stress mostly because there's only a couple of medications that are uh, approved by the FDA for use for post-traumatic stress and they all have uh, suicide black box warnings. A lot of times post-traumatic stress actually has accompanying it pain and that's where you got your post-traumatic stress from then pain might be a, a very big part of that. It, it's actually worked out better than we could have imagined. Scientists have already discovered that marijuana helps with post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as an array of other medical conditions like arthritis, migraines, muscle disorders, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Crohn's disease, fibromyalgia, and yes, I sound like I'm reading a list of side effects in a pharma commercial, but the list goes on. I'm an integrative pain management physician in South Florida. I am a primary care physician by trade. These doctors incorporate cannabis into their practice and claim to have seen an uptick in medical marijuana use during the pandemic. I think that as a physician during COVID, I've seen an increase in people using it for mental health. The majority of the patients that are coming in, their anxiety level is through the roof. Um, their fear, the um, their sensation of impending doom of what the future holds. They touted the plant's medicinal benefits. Cannabis is a natural plant that there's no toxicity, there's no lethal dose, and it's something that can help with symptoms. It also can really help prevent chronic disease. It's an additional tool in my toolbox to be able to manage and treat patients as naturally as possible with the least amount of side effects. But they also expressed caution. It's something that should be done under medical guidance. You have to have an understanding of the past medical history of the patient if you have a medical program in your state that you get a medical card so that you know everything has gone through that rigorous process through the Department of Health of being tested. But before medicinal marijuana can be adopted on the national level, it first needs to be reclassified so that it no longer shares a space with Schedule 1 drugs like heroin. What I would like to see is the descheduling of cannabis so that it's no longer a Schedule 1 so that we're able to use it in research. Whatever we do, allow it to be available and allow for us as scientists to research it, study it, and see the true benefits of it, and then allow that for our future generations. Marijuana was originally brought into Central America by Spanish colonists in the 16th century. 
And by the time it arrived to the U.S. from Mexico, it already had a nasty reputation of being associated with criminals and violence since recreational use was heavily concentrated in some of Mexico's most marginal environments like prisons and soldiers' barracks. America ran with that bad hombre public image, adding a xenophobic element because of who was smoking it. Nonetheless, we've come a long way. Because today, weed companies are still looking for ways to tap into the lucrative Latinx consumer market. And branding a product as Latinx owned is sometimes part of that strategy, even if it's not always true. I created my Susie Green's Instagram account a few months ago because of this need to be out in the cannabis community. And um, I get a follow by La Chingona Cannabis. I go to their website and I see three biographies of three Latina women, full names. They talk about, you know, how they're owners of these of this company. Three Latina owners from Guadalajara, Jalisco, where my family happens to be from. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what a dream. These Latinas, they faced the odds, they overcame them to not only work in the cannabis industry, but to be these trailblazers. Their Instagram person ended up meeting me uh, on my block to give me gifts, and it was an older white man. And I thought, oh, interesting. I saw the three Latina women, I would love to learn more. And he said, yeah, they're, they're not real. I just kind of nodded and I said, interesting. So who owns the company? And he told me it was uh, mostly non latinx men and one um, MLB player. And I wrote him an email and it was a passionate email saying, as a, as a colleague in the space, your approach of just reaching out to Latinas, it, just take a step back and really evaluate what's going on here. And his response was basically, oh, you're looking for a job, I see. No, sir, I'm here with for my, because of my responsibility as the Latina from Guadalajara. And that's where it began with his, uh, his, his need to hire me. I, I refused to work with them because at that point I would be helping them get away with cultural appropriation and I would not allow that. Then the, the chasing became, we want to offer you part of the company to claim that I was a Latina owner and then they could get away with it. It was very inappropriate to offer any percentage, but the percentage was less than 1%. We put a whole timeline of everything that happened, uh, screenshot by screenshot almost. Beehive BU outed them first and was like, we just found out, you know, that they're not Latina owned. And I said, no matter what happens, the truth is the only way and you cannot lie to this community. Today, only half of Latinxes in the U.S. support legalization, and the generational divide on the matter is clear. I had to wait until my mom was three margaritas deep before getting her to admit that she'd ever even touch the stuff. Maintaining social norms is very important in Latinx culture, and bicultural millennials love to poke that bear. My family actually uh, is very religious, so me using cannabis is something that I've always hidden. Lisa, who is also known as Vaccine Queen, created an online platform to celebrate black and brown women within the cannabis space. Her artwork and blog even led her to create her own cannabis events, but she says the fight for acceptance is far from over. I kind of throw it in there to my mom, but I really don't. Now that we're two years in, she kind of sees it, oh, this is a profitable thing for you. You do have the very traditional families and older generations that were negatively impacted by the criminalization. They saw people in their community go to jail, they saw violence around it, and so that is something that's <clears throat> very valid and, and that's going to take time to kind of work through. I think a lot of people's minds have been opening up around cannabis use, and that allows me to feel comfortable, which is definitely a privilege, because I know a couple decades ago you can you couldn't talk so openly about it. To me, marijuana uh, was unknown until I was the age of 16, more or less. And my buddies introduced me to this thing called pot. Over the years, I accepted it as part of our generation. I must have gone for 30 years without touching uh, a joint, which was kind of boring, actually. I'm 68, uh, and uh, I don't see anything wrong with it. If you attended elementary school in the 90s, DARE officers would have had you believe that all marijuana experimentation was a one-way bus ticket to crack cocaine addiction. Officer Jimenez had his points, and maybe fear-based education has its merits when you're five. 
But as adults, it's our responsibility to educate ourselves and allow our opinions to evolve as the science evolves. Between the growing medical usage, recreational legalization, and the media's efforts to normalize it, weed is close to becoming mainstream. And these Latinx artists are working to push it over the edge. ¿Cuál es tu posición sobre la, la marihuana medicinal y recreacional? Yo estoy súper de acuerdo con que sea legalmente recreacional y medicinal porque primero que nada recreacionalmente ayuda a la economía de un país, o sea, se ha sea visto ya. A mí me ayuda en los dolores de espalda, en los do en, en, me ayuda a crear, me, 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 me relaja, me, me ayuda con el estrés. Para mí esa es una de las musas mías, la, la, el cannabis. A mí me pone a viajar y yo escribo todo lo mío. A mí nadie me escribe lo mío. Yo compongo todo lo mío, le compongo a otra gente. Y a la hora de relajarme y, y escribir, pues nunca puede faltar el motito o, 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 o el feeling, como decimos nosotros. Hasta en el asiento me duele la nota. Una vueltita en la turbo y ser por la costa. ¿Y en algún momento pensaste que ser tan abierto con esto de la marihuana podría afectar tu carrera como artista? Me, me afecta con cierto público que todavía cree que es un tabú. Pero poco a poco la gente va abriendo su mente porque es que es algo que hace menos daño que muchas de las medicinas que crea el hombre. At the end of the day, numbers don't lie. Colorado was the first state to implement operational marijuana stores back in 2014, and its economy, one of the strongest in the nation, is thriving. With no competition from neighbors, states that legalize adult use sales early have seen enormous demand. And many Americans consider marijuana laws when deciding where to travel. Because no one wants to get their weed taken away by TSA, just like no one wants to rely on their 21-year-old neighbor for illicit edibles. Try getting legit THC levels for those bad boys. At least we know that legalizing it would not only eliminate that mystery, but also provide jobs and revenue to local economies, as well as an alternative to addictive opioids for those who need it. And we've known for decades that decriminalizing it on a federal level is a critical step in addressing racial justice and criminal justice reform. Federal legalization just seems like an inevitable next step. Until then, surviving 2020 should be enough for any adult to qualify for a medicinal prescription. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2020. See you soon. Thanks for watching Radar 2020. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below, and let us know what issues are important to you. But only the important ones, because the frivolous ones are like so 2019. <laughs>